let me take you through the mechanism of action of stimulants. Now, when we think about stimulants, we often tend to think about dexamphetamine and methylphenidate. At times, psychostimulants also include modafinil and armodafinil. It's important for us to understand what stimulants do because sometimes there is a stigma against the prescribing of stimulants. But essentially, they act through very similar transporters that some of the antidepressants act on. So let's look initially at dexamphetamine and methylphenidate. Names for dexamphetamine, the trade names include Adderall, Dexedrine, and we have the long-acting version, which is Vyvanse. For methylphenidate, we have Ritlin, Ritlin LA, and Concerta. So what do they do? Methylphenidate, it blocks NAT and DAT, the dopamine transporter and noradrenergic transporter, therefore increases levels of both noradrenaline and dopamine in the extracellular synaptic cleft. The key aspects here is these stimulants are used in the treatment of ADHD. In ADHD, what we're really trying to do is to stimulate or look at enhancing the action of the prefrontal cortex. We know in the neurobiology of ADHD, we need to have an optimum level of prefrontal cortex functioning to reduce, say, the hyperarousal, to reduce the impulse discontrol, and at the same time to enhance attention and vigilance. The two key receptors here are D1, dopamine, and alpha-2A. There is a Goldilocks effect in this prefrontal cortex. If there's too little of D1 and alpha-2A stimulation, then patients present with inattention and poor impulse control. If there's too much, then patients can present with significant rigidity or cognitive inflexibility. In some cases, it can also present with significant arousal symptoms or stimulus sort of response behavior without goal-directed activity. And that's why we can have things like tics, which is just simple habitual activity that goes on repetitively. So what we want is an optimum level of these two receptors being stimulated, which means that the levels of dopamine and nor adrenaline in the prefrontal cortex need to be optimum. And that requires dose adjustments and the understanding that too little or too much is not ideal. The role of the D1 receptor is to minimize noise. So it removes all that extraneous stimuli that individuals have in ADHD and allows for greater focus. The role of the alpha 2A receptor in the prefrontal cortex is to strengthen the neural networks. Noradrenaline also plays an important role in vigilance. So now that we know that methylphenidate increases levels of NA and DA, it stimulates D1, it provides benefits through alpha-2A, let's look at the side effect profile. It also stimulates the postsynaptic alpha and beta receptors. The alpha receptors, when stimulated, increase peripheral vascular tone, and this can result in increase in blood pressure, but in some patients, and often individuals with inflammatory disorders, it can result in Raynaud's phenomenon. And that's the reason why we use alpha-2 presynaptic agonists, which reduce this peripheral vascular resistance, such as clonidine, or we can use agents in some cases, such as vasodilators directly, topical nitroglycerin, for example. On the other hand, stimulation of the beta receptors increases heart rate and also blood supply to the muscles. Next, let's look at dexamphetamine. Now, dexamphetamine is a much more potent agent compared to methylphenidate. And the reason why that is, is because it has a significant dopaminergic potentiation. And let me take you through that aspect. Firstly, it blocks that, just like Ritalin or methylphenidate does. So there's increased dopamine in the synaptic cleft. But it also is a inhibitor of VMAT. By the way, methylphenidate is a non-competitive DAT inhibitor. Dexamphetamine is a competitive DAT inhibitor. So you can see it has a greater effect in blocking DAT as well. Furthermore, it is an inhibitor of VMAT. And because dexamphetamine is a VMAT inhibitor, what it does is it will be taken up into these vesicles and will displace dopamine into the presynaptic neuron. So you've got lots here and at a critical level, it will feed through even further into the synaptic cleft. This can be responsible for that euphoric effect that dexamphetamine can give, particularly at higher doses. Then we have 
the reversal of that. What does that actually mean? That, as we know, generally will, so let's put it here, that will normally take up dopamine. This reverses that, so instead of any uptake, it will actually force dopamine through further. So we've got that inhibition, we've got competitive inhibition with VMAT, it will be taken up in the vesicles and displace dopamine. Further, it will reverse the function of that and result in expulsion of dopamine even further, enhancing that euphoric effect and the stimulation of D1 receptors for beneficial effects. But as you can see, because it is a much more potent dopaminergic agent at significant doses, in some cases, individuals could end up very easily on this right-hand side. Note that dexamphetamine also blocks NAT. So you get the same effects that you would get with methylphenidate. So it's also responsible for increasing blood pressure, increasing heart rate, and of course, Raynaud's phenomenon in some individuals. But dexamphetamine has a third property, and that is blockade of CERT as well. So just like an SSRI or an SNRI, it will block CERT and increase serotonin. Why is this relevant? You might have noticed that dexamphetamine in some individuals is a much more activating agent than methylphenidate. This property can result in serotonergic activation or even serotonergic syndromes when combined with SSRIs in some individuals, particularly SSRIs at high doses. Caution is to be advised when you prescribe this with certain opioids as well, because opioids in some cases, some of them have serotonergic potentiation effects. So please look at the interactions of dexamphetamine because they are more significant compared to methylphenidate because of this CERT blockade property. In the treatment of ADHD in females, this becomes an important point. We know that females tend to have an emotional arousal model of ADHD, which means that CERT activation, particularly as we're adjusting the doses, can actually become very, very anxiogenic for many. And particularly in the premenstrual phase, or if some of the patients have PMDD, this CERT activation can be very, very anxiogenic and can result in emotional dysregulation. In clinical practice, generally, I consider Ritalin as a more first-line agent to get a feel for how patients respond because noradrenaline and dopamine is the key aspect I want to address. And I can get that in many cases with methylphenidate. If they don't respond, one can of course move towards dexamphetamine as well. But I'm always cautious about this CERT inhibition property and the really powerful dopaminergic potentiation. Now generally when it comes to stimulants and side effects, most of these side effects often occur in the initial stages when we're prescribing more immediate release agents. And that happens, of course, because of the pulses of dopamine that occur. Because we know that D1 receptors require very, very high levels of extracellular dopamine to stimulate them, which is very different from the D2 receptors. But it is these receptors that are responsible for reward-based learning, for motivation, for drive. Therefore, in the initial stages, when we prescribe this, we get a pulsatile dopamine activation and alpha-2A activation, which enhances the efficacy and treats the symptoms. But many a time, it's beneficial to move towards longer acting agents because patients experience the peaks and troughs, which can be quite unpleasant. Furthermore, our aim is to simply enhance the extracellular concentrations of dopamine so that through goal-directed activity, patients are able to obtain that reward by stimulating the D1 receptors through their own initiatives, activity, goals that they've taken on board. So overall in the treatment of ADHD, it becomes extremely important. It's not just about the prescription of the stimulant. It has to be combined with the striatal activation of the D1 receptors. And this happens through goal-directed activities. So now that we understand how dexamphetamine and methylphenidate work, and you can see they're essentially just acting on the same transporter systems. They're simply more potent. When we think about bupropion, for example, bupropion is an NDRI, which essentially means the same action. They block that and Bupropion blocks NAT. Increase noradrenaline, increase dopamine. Bupropion does not have additional actions that dexamphetamine has. It's actually quite similar to methylphenidate. Methylphenidate also is an NDRI, except that it's more powerful in terms of its affinity and reuptake inhibition property. With bupropion, there is one additional property. It is also a nicotinic receptor antagonist, and hence why it's prescribed in 
smoking cessation therapy as well. Bupropion is one of the agents that increases dopamine in the mesolimbic system as well, the reward pathway. And this can act as a real benefit, both in the treatment of depression, combating fatigue, but also to enhance the reward pathway where it's blunted. So the additional property that's beneficial in smoking cessation. This same property has also been utilized in a trial with methamphetamine dependent individuals. And this was combined with naltrexone, showing benefits. Next, we have atomoxetine. We know that atomoxetine is also used in ADHD. Bupropion is used in ADHD as a non-stimulant. Atomoxetine is also used as a non-stimulant. Atomoxetine is a NARI. It only blocks NAT, not DAT. So it's a step lower, which is why it's considered a non-stimulant. And when individuals have tics, for example, then atomoxetine can be prescribed. But with atomoxetine, one can still have other side effects that may be related to noradrenergic potentiation. So besides atomoxetine and bupropion, we also have other psychostimulants, which are armodafinil and modafinil. Both of these agents block that and to a lower extent, NAT. So they increase levels of both these neurotransmitters. Modafinil, much less that inhibition than r -modafinil. In other words, r increases dopamine more than modafinil would. The other interesting property with both these agents is that they stimulate the orexin neurons, and this enhances vigilance and wakefulness. This is one of the reasons they are prescribed in obstructive sleep apnea as well. They're useful agents in the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea independently, and also when obstructive sleep apnea is comorbid with depression. So what we can see now is that these are agents that are differential in their ability to increase noradrenaline and dopamine. Modafinil and r -modafinil also stimulate the orexin neuron. So they've got this slightly extra property. Bupropion has that slightly extra property of nicotinic receptor antagonism as well dexamphetamine, that additional third property. So each one's got its unique sort of properties that we need to keep in mind when treating patients with ADHD or augmentation strategies in other conditions. Overall, the aim, as I mentioned earlier, is to stimulate these D1 receptors, particularly in ADHD. That's the key aim. And I also talked about this pulsatile aspect. The key here is that we want to avoid a pulse type dopamine release because that is associated with euphoria and the pulse type dopamine release mimics substance use type reinforcement. And therefore providing a more tonic kind of dopamine release is much more preferable as opposed to this pulsatile. And that's why we want to consider longer acting agents with regards to stimulants. Fortunately, of course, when it comes to atomoxetine, we have them as longer acting in some ways. The half-life is longer. With bupropion, we know we have XR versions. And similarly, with r modafinil, it can be prescribed once a day. Modafinil sometimes has a BD dose. So do keep all of this in mind and the differential properties as well when treating patients with ADHD.